We're very privileged to be here today in North Staffordshire to talk to Robert Copeland, whose family's had a long connection with the ceramics industry. So welcome, Mr Copeland, or Thank Robert, you. if I may call you that, or perhaps I ought to call you Mr Robert. Well, I was called Mr Robert on the factory <coughs> because there were lots of Copelands on the, uh, on the management and... Uh, so they used to distinguish us by calling us by Mr. Robert, Mr. Ronald, Mr. Gresham, or whatever it was. Um, so I've always been called Mr. Robert by a lot of the uh, work people. But your family has a very long connection with the ceramics industry, going back more than two centuries. That is true, yes. My great-great-grandfather, William Copeland, was born in Lane End, that's uh, Longton in these days. Uh, he went to London when he was about 19 years old, and he uh, joined himself to Josiah Spode II, who had a shop in 4th Street, Cripplegate. And uh, he, over the years, he built himself up until uh, in 1805, he was taken as a partner to um, Josiah Spode II's son. And eventually, when he retired, uh, Copeland managed the whole business right up until, um, well, 1833, when his son bought the business. So we, we've had that long connection since 1784. So although the factory was, was known as Spode until the Spode and Copeland period, in fact, Copelands were connected with the company for a great deal longer than that. They managed the London business. Josiah Spode and his uh, son uh, managed the, the uh, Stoke-on-Trent business. And then after S Spode II died in 1827, then William Copeland took over the, uh, the um, man management of the company as well. And then he died in 1825. Um, so William Taylor Copeland, that's to say his son, who joined the partnership in London in 1824, he took over the business in 1833 and, and uh, it, subsequently it became known as Copeland and Garrett because there was no spose left in the business. And then in 1847, Garrett left the business and so it was totally Copeland. And W.T. <coughs> Copeland was quite an eminent citizen W.T. Copeland was a Londoner, born and bred, <coughs> and uh, he was a, an alderman of the Bishopsgate Ward, and in 1835 he was elected Lord Mayor of London, and so uh, he was a very prominent merchant. Um, he ran the, uh, uh, the company's business overseas as well, because a lot of the business was done from London overseas. Like, for example, in 1835, um, Copeland got a contract from the Hudson's Bay Company to supply wares for the uh, Canadian market. And um, so he was, he was very important and he had business overseas, like uh, Persia, for example. They did quite a big trade in Persia. Um, uh, th at that time, the company in London was known as Spode and Copeland. Um, whereas the business in, in uh, Stoke-on-Trent became known as Copeland's. So this was a very large business with international trade. It did have a big international trade, yes, it did. Um, always has done. Something like 60, 60 to 65 percent of its business was overseas, yes. And related to the other factories in Stoke-on-Trent, would you say it was a large business compared to the other names we might be familiar with? In, the, in these days, there are much larger factories like Wedgwood and Dalton, um, but we were of the same sort of size as Minton, uh, Masons and so forth like that. So we were a, a good-sized, medium-sized business. We had something like 28 um, bottle ovens, so we were significant, and we, um, we had the site next to the what became the uh, town hall in Stoke-on-Trent. We had a very, very central site. It was nine acres, uh, right bang in the middle of the town. So, in particular, some of the, the lines that were <coughs> developed 
um, through the, the, the Spode and later the, the Copeland and Garrett and then the Copeland factories. Um, some of them were very significant in the history of ceramics. Yes, Josiah Spode I uh, is credited with uh, developing, not inventing, but just developing the uh, process of transfer printing in blue under glaze. Under glaze is the important thing because uh, the printing in, in on glaze has been going on since 1760 or 1750s. But uh, Copeland developed the, uh, uh, Spode developed the um, transfer printing process for under glaze blue. And that was quite difficult because printing on uh, biscuit, that's to say the first fired clayware, uh, was quite difficult because of the porous nature of the body. Uh, and I think that uh, Spode's contribution was, in my view, was that he added soft soap and water to wetting the paper. It was known that wet, wet paper printed easier than, uh, than dry paper, so far as the pottery industry was concerned anyway. And he... Uh, he th added the soft soap and water, which en ended up by pr producing much more flexible paper for uh, applying it to odd-shaped uh, ceramic ware. Um, it also made it easier to wash off after the printing process. I haven't developed the printing process uh, in description, but uh, um, that is a well-known process. Um, which enabled the good quality wares to be uh, manufactured for the world's uh, consumption. Why do you think that underglazed blue transfer printed decoration became so popular? What do you think the demand stemmed from? Blue and white enhances the appearance of food. Uh, first of all, there's no blue food, or at least there shouldn't be, and uh, the appearance of food uh, on, on um, blue and white is enhanced. Even a piece of white bread and butter is more attractive on, on a blue printed plate than it is on an ordinary plate. <coughs> so it's also a, a relatively inexpensive process of decorating. And it is uh, underglaze so that it was impervious to material, to, to oils and things like that, and uh, it didn't wash off. What kind of people were buying this pottery? Ah, now then. Uh, we, we were supplying all sorts of people, uh, uh, rich people, less rich people, mid middle class, I would say, probably, mostly, um, but when you think of the uh, exports to Canada, the Hudson's Bay Company, I mean, there were all sorts of people buying it there. They were traders, uh, sometimes um, American Indians, or Canadian Indians, as I, perhaps I should call them. Um, and uh, the trade was quite considerable. Was blue... Um particularly desirable before the development of underglaze blue transfer printing on earthenwares? The Worcester factory was producing uh, blue printed wares. Uh, yes, um, cobalt blue has been a popular colour for uh, pottery decoration for oh, centuries, uh, starting, I don't know, in the 9th century um, AD or even perhaps earlier. Uh, the great thing about it is, is it, it uh, uh, would withstand a high temperature and, and f fasten itself to the wear. So it, uh, uh, it appealed to people producing uh, tin-glazed earthenwares, ordinary earthenwares. Um, it, it had a great, great uh, longevity. And would you say that it's been a staple of the factory ever since? Yes, it's certainly a spode factory. It's uh, transfer printed wares. We were leaders. And a lot depended on the quality of the engraving as well. So uh, the uh, standard, the technique of engraving improved enormously in the first 
20 years uh, after 1784, and uh, they were able to distinguish between tone and tone uh, by uh, stipple punching, for example. There was line engraving and stipple punching, and the stipple punching enabled them to get uh, different tonal qualities. Um, it was interesting, actually, to show the the difference between a line engraved background and a stipple punch background, and you can tell the difference, and it gives you a different tonal quality. You would recognise, if you looked at a piece, exactly how the plate had been engraved. Yes, yes, pretty well. Although blue <coughs> fluxes, so that at the high temperature at which it is fired, a lot of the individual dots are sometimes blurred to form a continuous tone of colour. So you can't always tell, but, uh, but that's one of its uh, charms, actually, of course. And Spode went on to make a huge range of patterns with all kinds of different subject matter for which they've since been very famous. Yes, the, uh, I think the, the background started because Josiah Spode II, that's the son, son of uh, mm. his father, um, he left the business in... Um, around about 1782, after his father took control of it. Um, the background is that Josiah Spode I had worked for Turner and Banks, so we believe, in Stoke, and subsequently bought the business. But he, because of his uh, arrangement with um, Thomas Mountford, I think it was Thomas Mountford, um, he had a, a, a deal which meant that he couldn't manufacture... Uh, on his own. So f until the arrangement had uh, expired, he wasn't able to actually put pot himself in on the uh, what, what became known as the Spode factory. And he acquired the business as an investment in 1776, but put his two sons, one was 19 and the other was 17, uh, in control of the management. And of course they lived at home and they... Uh, would consult their father at night time to find out what they should be doing. And uh, <clears throat> then after, after the expiry of the deal with, um, with Mountford, he, Josiah Spode I took over the running of the business in Stoke. And so his elder son was able to go to London and set up a, a retail business, which he did. He had to obtain... Uh, a membership of a livery company in order to trade in London, and he became a member of the Spectacle Makers Company, which I think showed great vision. Uh, then um, uh, he opened his shop in 4th Street, Cripplegate, and I don't know what exactly what he was selling apart from his father's goods, but I think he was probably selling other people's goods as well. But he became aware of the wares that had been imported by China, from China, by the East India Company, and it was becoming increasingly difficult to obtain matchings or extra pieces from, um, from China because the East India Company was gradually uh, stopping importing porcelain because it was, uh, they were losing money on it. So I believe that Spode uh, would take in uh, Chinese pieces and offer to make replacements for them in, in, uh, in, in earthenware. And he did very well. So we built up a, a series of designs, uh, which I call Chinese landscapes, um, based on the Chinese originals, but, in, uh, but engraved on copper plates so that they could be reproduced, uh, well, almost ad infinitum. And so he built up a trade in Chinese landscapes uh, on, on earthenware, what we call pearlware these days, uh, transfer printed in blue under the glaze. Um, and in addition to those oriental designs, there are a number of uh, more European patterns as well for which the factory's become famous since. Yes, most of the patterns that we are familiar with were recorded after 1800. You know, the chap who, who um, produced the, the pattern books 
he, uh, he started the pattern books. He came to work for Spode, and he started the set, a series of pattern books, which we date to about 1800, and, and continued right up until recently. Um, many of those patterns were hand-decorated, hand-painted, uh, on earthenware, and then uh, around about 1799 or something like that, uh, Josiah Spode the first... Um, no, no, just before then, he'd been working on uh, developing a bone china body, uh, which was a purer form of bone porcelain. And uh, I think uh, uh, he is given the credit for the introduction of bone, but uh, actually, of course, he didn't. It was introduced by Thomas Fry in 1744, but uh, what he did do was eliminate the the um, glass forming uh, ingredients of the glaze and the and the pottery uh, so that it became a, um, a wholly um, raw material just just uh, they used uh, something like fifty percent of bone ash uh, 25% of Cornish stone, which is a felspathic stone, and 25% of Cornish china clay. Uh, and that was mainly the uh, the basis of the bone china formula. Um, and that became very popular because it was much easier to fire. Uh, it fired straight, and he could use a, a standard earthenware oven, only just fire it about 100 degrees uh, centigrade higher than earthenware and uh, eventually bone china uh, e e evolved to the point where other manufacturers uh, gave up china uh, gave up porcelain and uh, made bone china so bone china was another very uh, important development made at the yes, it, yes, factory. It, it was very important indeed. When one thinks of the period in which uh, Josiah Spode was developing his business, we're right in the middle of the Napoleonic Wars. And so they, uh, they had Chinese porcelain to compete with, but the, the, the imports of Chinese porcelain were rather less, I think, and certainly there was practically no imports from Europe at that time. So um, the uh, English manufacturers more or less had an open field to, um, to exploit. Thinking about the technology in the ceramics industry and the implementation of steam, other industrial developments in the industry, and you've done quite a lot of work on the research of uh, mechanisation in the industry, haven't you? Just a little bit, yes. The, um, uh, introduction of the steam engine was very important because uh, up until that time, of course, the operating of the the wheels and so forth like that was done by hand, uh, by somebody turning a wheel uh, and uh, operating the thrower's wheel. Um, by employing a steam engine to provide power, uh, this made it much more easy to much more easy to um, uh, develop more skills, more people, businesses became bigger. Um, the first steam engine, I think, that was employed in the pottery industry was actually on Spode's factory, but it wasn't an ordinary straightforward uh, steam engine. It was a, a beam engine, what we call a beam engine, which was actually a pumping engine, which pumped water to an over, uh, overhead tank from which the water flowed over a water wheel. And that was his first, uh, first introduction in 1778. And in fact, it predated Josiah Wedgwood's Bolton and Watt uh, steam engine, which he in, uh, installed, I think, in about 1782. So uh, Josiah Spode can, can claim to be the first person to produce a steam engine in, in the pottery industry. Um, he adapted the what was known as the Newcomen engine. Um, a lot of the uh, raw materials, like flint and Cornish stone and bone, were ground in 
uh, mills outside the the uh, centre of Stoke, in the in the um, surrounding villages, where there was water supply, so that they were driven by uh, water, um, <coughs> and um, they continued to be used. Right up until the 17th, into the 1960s, actually, they were still grinding, grinding uh, raw materials in the uh, in the neighbourhood. Um, and you're particularly associated with um, Chattelton Flint Mill. Well, that's right. What happened? What happened was I was privileged to be given three years' work at the at Spode, uh, learning the the trade. So I spent a whole year um, making um, bone china platters by hand, another year making bone china plates by hand, um, and then the third year trying everything else. Well, now while I was while I was working at um, the making of platters, it occurred to me that uh, the skills that were being uh, operated on the Spode factory at that time were still virtually the same as had been going on for the nine, you know the last couple of hundred years, and it would be nice to protect some of them for posterity. So I was talking with somebody at uh, at, at a lunch party about the idea, and it then occurred to me. I thought, oh yes, and of course we not only ought to preserve a pottery but we should also preserve a flint mill, uh, which is a, a, an integral part of some potteries, but some of the bigger potteries like Spode and Wedgwood had their own flint mill. Somebody said, oh yes, well there's one for sale. Uh, so I followed, followed up this uh, lead and I got Rex Wales, who was an in industrial archaeologist, uh, and he came up to uh, Stoke to have a look at it. And he said, oh, no, that's far too, far too big and far too recent. It's not nearly so interesting. The, the mill that you want to save is Chettleton Flint Mill, uh, which dates back to 1253. So to cut a long story short, um, we acquired, when I say we, a, a small trust was formed to acquire the Chettleton Flint Mill as a, as a national monument. Um, now, while we were still in the throes of um, developing the uh, the mill as a an, as a tourist attraction, you might call it, as a, a monument, um, the uh, Gladstone pottery came up for sale, uh, and uh, the city of Stoke on Trent uh, decided that they would try and and. Um, uh, rescue a pottery. Uh, so they formed a small subcommittee, including Arnold Mountford. And uh, we looked at six different pottery factories around the uh, district. And the one that we chose to uh, recommend was the Gladstone pottery. And the city of Stoke on Trent went into quite elaborate plans as to how to preserve it and acquire it. Well, then one day they decided, the um, owners decided that they were going to sell it and probably demolish it. So we, we, the Chattelton Flint Mill Trust actually got together to see whether we couldn't preserve it. Well, we got, got some uh, financial support promised, but what ended up was that uh, Dalton's and H&R Johnson's put some money together and saved the Ch saved the Gladstone Pottery Museum, which is meant, of course, that it's that it's um, safe for years. And I was uh, uh, intimately involved with that, and so it really came out of the the thought uh, that I had when I was actually working as a as a potter. One of the most popular patterns, of course, is the willow pattern. Indeed it is. It's the most popular pattern uh, worldwide. Uh, it's been produced not only on pottery, of course, but it's been produced on everything. Uh, tin plate, <coughs> books, um, plastic mugs, everything. 
Uh, and the reason is, is it's got an, a human interest to it. People are fascinated by the three socialists on the uh, uh, on the um, on the bridge, and uh, of course a story was built up. Um, the first story I think of it was written in seven, uh, 1849 in a, in a uh, magazine called the Penny Magazine, and uh, the the story of the willow pattern. Um, caught on, everybody was fascinated by it, and it makes uh, a talking point. I mean, it, it, you, if you've got a dinner party and you, you've got an interesting uh, design on the tableware, um, it's got something to talk about. Um, Willow Patton uh, was created, I believe, on the Spode factory around about 1790 and developed from a, an earlier Chinese pattern called what we call Mandarin. Um, uh, it was produced by um, Carfley fa Factory in Shropshire, but it was also produced by Spode because it was one of the matchings which he was asked to copy. Uh, and then somebody on the Spode Factory decided to make it a bit more interesting by adding the bridge with the three people on it. and. Uh, and a pavilion to which they were going, and it gave rise to the story, the uh, legend, which of course was created by this chap, which is unknown, we don't know who it was, um, but it appeared in this magazine in two sections. Um, I was lucky enough to get a copy of the original book, actually, um, Blue and White, uh, persisted for years and years and years, uh, so, uh, and it's persisted, and of course, gradually, as the technique for as, uh, engraving and then tech transfer printing developed, so other designs were developed in all sorts of ways. I mean, the transfer printed uh, business is, is enormous, and the um, the the two great societies. That uh, that collected like uh, the Friends of Blue and the uh, Transfer Printed uh, Collectors Club. Uh, they've done an enormous amount to uh, to um, encourage people to to take an interest in in transfer printed wares, and of course it was not only blue. There's other colours, and this is where the Transfer Printed uh, Collectors Club. Uh, really score over the Friends of Blue because the Friends of Blue don't don't touch colours <laughs> wares, uh, and I don't think I don't actually think that there were so many coloured wares produced for the English market. I think they were more particularly for the United States market. Manufacturers looked to outside sources for um, for their inspiration and book illustrations. Uh, for travel books and things like that were very, very popular, particularly uh, because of the uh, interest of the British Empire in India and China and, and places like that. There were lots of books written about different places in the Far East, and they, uh, these subjects were used not only, uh, not only by Spode. Spode used the ones... Uh, familiar with what we call the Indian sporting series, but uh, there were masses of other subjects that were, were specialised by different manufacturers like Rogers and Riley and and goodness knows what I can't remember all the names, uh, because it was a, a huge industry of blue, blue and white, and and. A lot of coloured wares as well, but as I said, I think the coloured wares were mostly made for the uh, the export markets in uh, North America. I'd like to ask you about your association yourself with the the company. You're obviously uh, you worked on the factory at um, at the sharp end, so to speak. But more recently, you've been associated with factory's historical advisor. And uh, I do recall you enjoyed particularly taking people around to see the bottle ovens that were on site. Yes. I was privileged to fire a bottle oven, actually, successfully, a biscuit bone china bo bo uh, oven. Uh, I didn't do it for choice because uh, the fireman was ill. 
And uh, <coughs> I went to the earthenware farmer and said, would you fire it? He said, well, I can't fire it, Robert. Um, I've got two ovens to fire already, but I'll keep an eye on you. You could do it. <laughs> You've done it before. Well, I hadn't done it before, but I had, in fact, been round with, um, with the farmer, Jim, Jim Evans, and I'd taken copious notes as to what he did at each stage. I, I followed the whole of the firing um, with um, taking notes so that it was a bit like a recipe. Uh, I was going round the pottery, I was going round the oven, looking at my notes, what do I do now, you know? <laughs> but it was successful, it was a perfect, perfectly fired um, bottle oven. Uh, and people just couldn't understand uh, how it was done, because you've got eight, eight fire mouths and you had to balance the heat from each one of these on, around the circular uh, oven. Uh, you had to control the draft. Uh, it was a very, very highly skilled operation, even though I said it, I did it. Um, the, the fireman was doing it every week. Um, and you, you judged the heat by looking through spy holes and things like that into the, uh, uh, into the interior of the oven. Uh, was that the bottle oven that uh, eventually was, was on site that rather came to a sticky end? I was walking past it one day. We were going to pr pr preserve it. We were going to put uh, steel bands around it to protect it because it was built in 1789, the, uh, so we believe, the actual hovel, not the kiln inside. The kiln inside was usually probably rebuilt every 40 years or so, but the the uh, hovel on the outside, which is the characteristic shape, uh, <coughs> was built in 1789, and we thought we would preserve it. Uh, and so we'd given instructions to um, a local firm to put iron bands around it, which was quite a common way of protecting it. And I was walking past it, w talking with somebody, uh, and... Uh, it occurred to me that we were going to lunch and it occurred to me that uh, it had looked as if it was bul bulging a little bit. So we went to lunch, came back, and later on I was walking uh, with the uh, clay manager along on the grass, and I shouldn't have been walking on the grass because the managing director didn't approve of walking on grass. And I was walking on the grass, and the very fact that I was walking on the grass enabled me to hear a rumble of thunder. But it was a blue sky, and I thought, that's not thunder, that's the bottle oven. So I ran uh, with my friend, uh, ran away from the bottle oven, and the whole of the hovel collapsed just like a, a, a tree falling, just at the parallel route that I was taking. So fortunately, nothing, uh, no bricks fell off and hit me, but uh, um, there was no puff of dust or anything. It was absolutely sodden with water. And so that was eight, 1972, it, it fell down. And so we, we, we were left with just the kiln inside. And then the architects said that they, they, they should be pulled, pulled down because they're unsafe. So we've ended up with just the, the main foundations of the, uh, of the kiln. So there are not many kilns left. There are about, I think there's something like 30 or 40 left in the pottery industry, um, pottery district. But none of, them, none of them can be fired again. And what about the, the Spode factory site? That is a problem, because the, <coughs> the, the competition that we receive from uh, overseas is so intense that we can't compete on price, producing our fine quality wares. So we've been obliged to take the factory produce away, and so we've gone to places like China and India and Malaysia. And, um, what has happened to the Spode site, which is, as I said earlier, is nine acres, right bang in the middle of the uh, town, next to the town hall. And you can't imagine, I mean, I, I, I can't imagine any town in the world that's got a, a, an up-and-running factory of nine acres site next to the city hall. 
uh, you usually got things like cinemas and, and uh, libraries and things like that. Uh, the site has been offered for sale to a development company. Uh, we don't know what his plans are yet, but we believe that they will include uh, a museum. We have a, a pottery museum, a uh, Spode museum on the site at the moment, but most of that stuff is being packed up because of the, the failure of the roof, which is uh, leaking. And so we've got, had to pack up the, the um, display to preserve it. Um, what's going to happen to it, we just don't know, because the developer hasn't made his plans clear. And because of what they call the credit crunch, we just wonder, in fact, whether the, uh, the development of the site will proceed as swiftly as we had hoped. It may be that they will pull out so we just don't know. The whole thing is, is very fraught with, uh, with uncertainty. Um, it would be a shame. Because the Spode Trust is a charitable trust. It has virtually no money of its own. Uh, it depends on goodwill from other people. Um, the premises on which it was displayed would belong to Spode Limited or Spode, the Spode company, and they are, <coughs> they are strapped for cash as well, like a lot of manufacturers. I mean, we're not the only one by a long chalk. I mean, we're still surviving, uh, whereas some of the factories have closed down. But um, uh, change and decay, you know, is all around we see, and uh, we've just got to put up with... Uh, doing the best we possibly can to preserve the, um, the collection as it is. It's a very, very good collection. I've had a lot to do with it. As you said, I was the, the uh, advisor for uh, 17 years, and uh, I built up the collection, particularly of the, the 19th century, which uh, the later 19th century, which was, uh, had been rather neglected by my uncle, who had formed the collection in the first place in 1925. So um, it's. Um, it's well, I hope there, there will be a, a, a good future for for the museum collection and possibly. For well, we site. hope so. We need we need a, a site where it can go. We need a lot of money um, to provide the site. Even if we even if the developer gives us a site, we're going to need money mm. to um, produce display cases and, and things like that, and we don't know what space we're likely to get. So the whole thing is up in the air, as you might say. Thank you very much for speaking to me this afternoon, uh, Robert. It's been a uh, great pleasure. Well, well, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a privilege.